go ahead and get started. Um, welcome everybody and thanks for joining us. Um, I'm Cliff Lynch. I'm the director of the Coalition for Networked Information. Uh, you have reached one of the project briefing sessions on the beginning of the third week of the CNI Fall um, 2020 virtual member meeting. Uh, week three is dedicated to technology, infrastructure, standards, and related issues. And um, I'm delighted you're here with us. Uh, I think you're really going to enjoy this. A couple of logistical things. We're recording this session. Uh, the recording will be available to meeting attendees quite quickly and shortly thereafter to the general public. There is closed captioning that you can make use of if you wish. Um, there is a chat box. Please feel free to use that as we go along. Uh, and there is a Q&A tool at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we will take Q&A at the end and Diane Goldenberg Hart from CNI will moderate the Q&A session. Uh, I do want to note that with week three, we have released a bunch of pre-recorded videos as well as the live sessions that we'll be doing throughout the course of the week. And with that, let me turn to the topic at hand. We have, um, with us two speakers today, both from the University of California at San Diego, Roger Smith and Scott McAvoy. And uh, they are gonna talk about a project which I think is just marvelous. Um, I uh, saw it and um, just felt we had to get it to CNI uh, on a couple of bases. This is a very technically interesting project, um, and it you know sort of stands in a series of efforts to reconstruct based on photographic evidence. Um, I'm thinking of things like Microsoft Research's work with Photosynth. Um, over the years. Uh, but it also raises a lot of really strategic questions about the roles of special collections, the role of libraries, about how we document place um, and historic place, especially in an era where we are losing historic places because of wars, climate change, and other disasters. And um, so I just think it it's one of these things that's absolutely uh, what I hope to bring to CNI. So with that, um, let me shut up and turn it over to uh, Roger. I believe you're going to start. I am. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having us, Cliff. And thank you, everyone, for joining today. Um, Scott and I are so pleased to be able to present our work on the UC San Diego effort to reconstruct digitally the ancient Temple of Bell in Palmyra, Syria, which is an effort to preserve the overall cultural heritage of the region of Palmyra, along with other sites uh, around the globe for future generations. Scott, you wanna switch the slides? So just briefly, I will uh, outline the presentation today and talk a little bit about what we'll be sharing. Um, I'll provide a little context and framework around the work of the Digital Media Lab, uh, and also its home program within the library, the Scholarship Tools and Methods Program. Uh, Scott will do a deep dive into the Temple of Bell project, um, and then I'll wrap up with a little bit broader context around um, the future of our endeavors in this space, our repository work, um, and how we're connecting to our campus endeavors. And then, of course, we'll leave time at the end for questions uh, for both of us. Next slide. All right. So a little bit of background, um, just sharing with you the, some context for where projects like this sit within the library. Uh, the Digital Media Lab, or DML, um, is a unit within Scholarship Tools or Methods, or STM, we love our abbreviations. Um, and STM, or Scholarship Tools and Methods, Scholarship Tools and Methods includes a variety of activities, or oversees and supports a variety of activities associated with digital asset management uh, and uh, the development of um, content, management of content in our main repository, along with other UCSD and UC managed uh, digital asset platforms. Um, STM also engages in work around emerging formats, um, including reformatting of content uh, and the application of format types to new modes of teaching and research. 
Within that context, the Digital Media Lab, or DML, has evolved from its origins that were largely kind of framed around the concept of makerspace. Um, we still maintain um, a physical space, if the library were open, that provides um, services such as 3D printing, high-level digi digital media workstations. Um, but the DML has evolved into a strong virtual component. It's really grounded in facilitating project-based exploration, kind of centered in the use of new emerging formats for teaching and research. Uh, that includes, it's not limited to point clouds, uh, 3D virtual reality, and the application of AI to enhance services around these formats. The DML is increasingly connected to other services and activities, both in the library and across, uh, I'm sorry, both in the STM program and across the library. These include geospatial and data services and data visualization, research data, especially the curation of research data involving uh, unique format needs, the work of the DML has a close relationship with our uh, Technology and Digital Experience Unit, or TDX, providing both support, uh, wh where they provide support both for immediate technological needs, as well as de development of um, existing and future platforms. Uh, in addition, the kind of exploration of new formats and their use informs our overall uh, understanding of, de of, of a development trajectory for the core repository in terms of its capacity and capability. Very briefly, I'll share that our repository is a locally maintained Samvera-based DAMS with a Blacklight-based uh, front end on a custom storage layer. Support for the DAMS draws from expertise across a, a range of library programs, including STM, Metadata Services, our technology unit, and more. One feature of the repository ecosystem um, is a strong connection, or direct connection rather, to our Chronopolis Digital Preservation Repository, adding that aspect of digital preservation uh, to the content that we develop and manage. And finally, I'll note that we're increasingly developing features and functionality in partnership with other UC campuses, especially UC Santa Barbara, through a project we call um, Project Surfliner. The intention there is to maximize uh, the efficiency of development through shared goals and through pooled development resources. So with that, uh, as a, at least a brief uh, ecosystem context, I'll kick it over to Scott to take it away and, and do a deep dive into the Temple of Bell project. Thanks, Roger. First, I'd like to start by introducing Basil Cartabil. And Basil's a really interesting um, character in all of this. He's an open source software developer, or it was an open source software developer um, with close ties to the Creative Commons and Mozilla Foundations. Um, he was an advocate for a free and open internet. And in, in Syria in 2012, that was sort of a, a dangerous thing to be. The Arab Spring and the, the beginnings of the Syrian uprising had just sort of happened and um, abated. And a lot of the, the protests and eventually the um, armed insurrections had been coordinated via social media and the, the open internet. And it was sort of seen as um, the enemy of the state. So Basil is imprisoned in 2012 by the Syrian government. And I don't think they actually ever charged him with any crime. But one of the last projects that Basil had worked on before he was imprisoned, um, we see here a 3D um, reconstruction of the city of Palmyra as it would have been in the third century AD at its height. And Palmyra had been a very important Silk Road city, um, an oasis in the desert, sort of a, a gateway between the Roman Empire and the, the Parthian Empire. Um, it had been, you know, important and prosperous for thousands of years. Um, one of the, you know, is well known for its monumental architectures. If you're a, a merchant and you have a successful caravan, um, you spend some of the money on on you know, um, a tomb or, or a temple or, or some other giant public works. And yeah, you can see all the, the tombs and temples out on the edges here, all done by these wealthy merchants. So this is the part I struggle with is changing the slide. There we go. Okay, so I wanna show you some examples of the um, existing side of Palmyra. This is its theater. And you can see the, the remains of decoration up here. It's just wildly ornate. Every single square inch would have had some sort of decoration over it um, back at its height. Um, you can see 
this site right here, the, the monumental arch, here it is on the, the Syrian 50 pound bill, along with a um, character Zenobia here who had been, um, she had been sort of the empress of the independent Palmyrene um, empire for a while. It, um, it threatened the Roman empire. It was such a, such a wealthy center of power. And you can see, so the, the association with the regime is this, you know, points to Syria as, as once being very prosperous and very powerful on the world stage as part of the Roman Empire. And then here is the Temple of Bell, which we've reconstructed for this project. And this is uh, an important religious building for thousands of years. Um, it kept changing and adapting. It had been an Assyrian temple to the god Baal and it kept taking on different flavors. It became um, sort of a, a Greek pagan temple, a Roman pagan temple, a Greek Orthodox church, and eventually a mosque too, um, all the while, you know, serving different communities and, and, you know, taking on all these different flavors, but still being central to the, the community. I also want to show Palmyra has this amazing tradition of these funerary busts. And there is still about 3,000 of these extant. And these are carvings of real individuals with their, their names and their familial connections inscribed um, next to their faces. So, you know, as, as ancient sites go, it's a very personal uh, one where you see individual people still sort of dotting this, this you know, ancient beige desert landscape. So, Basil is in prison. Um, in March 2012, he's kept in solitary for a while. Eventually, he's moved to a more open prison camp where he's allowed to um, um, contact the outside world. Um, there, you know, he hasn't been charged. There aren't a lot of um, options to defend himself locally within, within the Syrian legal system or whatever. Um, but he has all these, you know, ties to international open uh, information organizations. He's, um, you know, well known and important. And his his friends um, internationally begin this sort of social uh, media campaign, which is very successful. They end up going, um, you know, posing his case to the European Parliament and the United Nations, um, both of which I think I've got the quote here. Yeah, they they call his imprisonment arbitrary and call for his immediate release. He still hasn't been, you know, formally charged with anything. In 2015, he's been in prison for um, over three years now. He's transferred to a new location. He goes silent, and and people start to fear the worst. Um, so so the the media campaign ramps up. They're trying to boost his profile. MIT Media Lab offers him a, a research position. Um, anything that they can do to, you know, to try to dissuade the, the Syrian government from um, from executing him, but they eventually do, um, which, you know, isn't actually confirmed until 2017. So there's, you know, this whole time from September where where nobody quite knows what's going on. So at the same time, ISIS is um, rolling into Palmyra. This is a picture of the, the Temple of Bell before and after. This is a picture of, um, you know, what they did at the museum. Um, you know, they're, they're going around smashing faces. This um, it's a symbol of the current regime that are using it to point to, you know, Syrian power, but it's also a, a symbol of other religions and paganism and iconography and everything. So it's a, uh, a real important target for ISIS. And so through this, the same people that had run the Free Basel social media campaign, um, this huge group internationally with all of these high level organizations, they sort of, you know, they, they feel that they've they failed, but they want to keep this momentum going and they funnel their energies and their support into creating the new Palmyra project. And New Palmyra ends up getting about 3,000 high-resolution images of Palmyra um, over the course of, of a decade and a half um, made to be public domain. And these are very 
this is a very important site because you know not only are they super high resolution they maintain their exif data which is really important for 3d reconstruction so i need to emphasize this is a real feat in that there's thousands of high resolution images all in one place they're made totally free public domain the exif data is intact there is you know like no better um, sandbox out there for, for 3D reconstruction. And for some perspective on that, you know, there are a bunch of gaps in our 3D model. And if we were to go about buying, you know, um, commercially available photographs of, to, to fill in these gaps, these, these places in the model that aren't shown in any of the photographs that we have, um, a single photograph can can cost five hundred dollars to license by traditional media standards. Um, so if if you gave me a grant for you know half a million dollars, I would still run short of acquiring a, a full collection of um, the commercially available media that I could apply to this project and, and make it more complete. Um, I want to mention Reuters is actually starting to license their media in bulk for machine learning data sets. So hopefully that sort of license will eventually transfer over. If we're only using the data to try to, you know, extract points and measurements and, and create a larger whole, I'm very interested to see where that's going. So I want to talk about the actual reconstruction process using structure from motion. And this is this, here we go, okay. It's this process by which uh, individual photos have clusters of high contrast tagged. And then those clusters are compared to each other. Um, and you're able to sort of triangulate their position in 3D as one cluster moves over here relative to another cluster. So you can see what's going on here. Each one of these pyramids is, is like pointing up to the angle, the individual photo involved. So then here you can see one of the individual photos. One of the, the enemies of this process is things that change. So you see I've had to manually mask out things like uh, the tourists themselves, the sky, the gravel, um, vegetation, anything that can change over time. Um, I want to show two. So through this process, I placed about 90 points manually here going through all the photos and and saying this is that and this is that so i did 90 of those but um this algorithm is choosing about 5000 of these per image and honestly you know we'd started building public services around photogrammetry in the digital media lab um you know people would bring in a, an object and we'd use it to 3d scan and 3d print it and it was a big surprise um, that it worked as well as it did in this use case. We have enough trouble scanning a, a student's face or an apple or, or something like that. So that, you know, we got anything out of this was just incredible. I mean, we just kept refining it and, and got something better and better each time. So, oh, okay. So we're, we're left with this model and it's a challenging data set. Um, you know, the, the numbers have lost all meaning at this point. It's 1.2 billion points um, using over 800 different photos for, for different parts of the model. Um, altogether is about 80 gigabytes of data. And it's a big challenge to figure out how to share that data set. And how do we, how do we place this with an archive too? How do we connect the model back to the images and you know, allow the user to explore these things in, in a way that's more or less continuous. And we stumbled upon, there we go, this viewer right here, the Poetry Point Cloud Viewer. And you can see this is the entire full resolution being rendered in browser. Anybody can pull this up in, in Chrome or Firefox and just explore it manually. I'm manipulating it manually right now. I can click around, go to these different regions of interest, and you see it's filling in detail as we go based on my camera's position. 
So I'm on Zoom over Wi-Fi and it's still doing a, a pretty good job here. You can see this, you know, um, this faint painting from the fourth century on the wall, all these crazy stone carvings. I'll, I'll go around a little bit here. I wanna show you can zoom into read individual inscriptions. And it's, it's really this incredible new ability to, you know, scale our view in a streamlined way between details which are sub millimeter and details which are, you know, many tens of meters long. So, yeah, this, this means a lot of different things. This viewer is, you know, built on existing uh, JavaScript and HTML libraries, it's totally open. Um, it's resolution agnostic. It, the, the simplicity of its implementation with HTML and JavaScript means that we can customize it like crazy too. We can, you know, we've got it linked back to our digital collections here. Oh, I forgot to show all the other features. We can do some basic analyses in here. We can, you know, do, do measurements and annotations as we please. Um, we can do clipping boxes to, you know, separate out particular regions here. And here, you can you can walk around this thing in VR. Um, I want to show you know the custom interactions that we can do. I have this incredibly high resolution 1.2 billion point model, and I can just click another button to pull up another high resolution model, which is the the same site in 2016 after it's exploded. And we're able to make this one from some commercially available drone footage. So that, I mean, all these capabilities to, to communicate super high resolution data and the ability to sort of link it back to everything else, um, you know, it, it shows a lot of promise in the, in the way, you know, not only the way we use the archives, but the way we integrate um, different data sets with each other. I'd like to turn it back to Roger to take us home on that point. Well, thanks, Scott, for the deep dive into the project. Um, I'll, I'll, I will try and be respectful of time and wrap up fairly concisely here. Um, this type of project, um, as I mentioned earlier, is a, a kind of a core component of exploring new formats within the digital media lab and scholarship tools and methods. Um, kind of this work allows us to collaboratively explore areas of need on campus, work with partners to ascertain what a, a sustainable service model looks like between um, campus and library partners working on these, form these formats, these transformative technologies. Um, in addition, the library itself uses these efforts to gain a more well-defined sense of direction with respect to our repository infrastructure, what our capacity should look like, to ingest, make available, and preserve uh, these new and emerging formats. So um, endeavors like these exemplified by DML and STM, there's always challenges and opportunities. Um, challenges certainly are reflected in resources in terms of staff and budget, sustainability of the service and the capacity to engage um, this work at scale, what that scale might look like, and also alignment with competing priorities. And one way to kind of engage these challenges is to answer and answer questions around sustainability is to work backwards, I like to call it, from, um, from outcome. So we ask a series of questions. What's the impact of the work uh, to, to the future of teaching and research on campus? How does this support a varied set of activities across uh, in the library, but across disciplines? How does exploration in this space inform and craft you know, a kind of an, uh, a model for flexible, impactful, and sustainable repository ecosystems. And these are questions we're constantly revisiting as we track new use cases and look at the shifting landscape of resource challenges and opportunities. Uh, while at first glance, um, you know, limited resources might indicate competition for priorities, but the challenge is to engage in a conversation or series of conversations that builds consensus and articul articulates both short, medium, and long-term goals that are kind of commonly understood and provide a kind of a uniform direction. And finally, I'll mention that another goal the library and scholarship tools and methods has when we return to full operation post-pandemic is to instantiate a replacement for um, a workstation we've maintained called a cave kiosk. Um, and the, re the replacement and the concept will take the form of a high-resolution media display 
intended to showcase projects such as the Temple of Bell and provide an interactive workspace allowing the promotion and engagement with these types of uh, objects and services. So there's both a, a physical instantiation and the virtual web-based instantiation of a lot of these projects to both spur interest, engagement, and use. And that's our hope for um, our exploration in this space. And with that, in just a few minutes left, I'd love to entertain any questions you may have for Scott or I. Thanks, Roger. And thank you, Scott. Uh, just a fascinating project, amazing. Um, we really appreciate your bringing it to CNI to share with our community. I, uh, I dropped um, the URL in the chat there, which I believe is the access point for the general public to um, explore this tool. Is, can you see that, Scott? I just want to make sure that's the right um, link there. Yep, I even clicked it to make sure. Okay, we're, great. We're good, yeah. Great. Uh, so the floor is open for questions, and I hope um, our attendees will uh, share your questions with us um, while we're waiting. I was just curious, could you just chat a little bit about who some of your partners were on this project? What, who was involved? How long did it take? How many, how many hands in the kettle? This, this was largely a, a passion project for myself. I'd begun working with some, um, some people from Bates College in Maine, and okay. we'd been working on constructing um, uh, the site Dura Europus, and it all sort of snowballed. At some point, I became involved with the New Palmyra project itself. Um, but, but really, yeah, it just became a, a personal project. Um, it was mostly me just sifting through image databases and, you know, clipping out um, what's it called? Clipping out all the, all the tourists. That's amazing. Well, thank you. That is quite extraordinary. If, if I could also jump in, Scott, just to add to your question, uh, to your answer rather, and to Diane's question, this, this project does build on a history of the library's work with our archeology span department and mm -hmm. faculty members here doing similar data visualization around LIDAR data and around um, other archeological sites that have been uh, imaged in one form or another. Um, and yet what Scott has done here in this project is obviously explore a new level mm -hmm. of transformation from still imagery to a three-dimensional model. So it builds on a history and has good connection to uh, archaeology endeavors on campus and in the library. That, mm -hmm. yeah, this, this served as a use case that we've already applied to a lot of other archaeological projects at UCSD. So it's nice to have the, the project that we can control and do whatever we want with and apply it in whatever way without constraints of um you know um academic partners who need to publish and have all these other um concerns over how their data is used sure okay thank you very much uh, i see that cliff has a question go ahead cliff um so i i actually have two questions I, some of this reconstruction work around palmyra is looking really familiar like um uh, I, I believe I saw a museum exhibition on it um, someplace maybe a year, 18 months ago. Um, uh, does that ring any bells? Yeah, there, there have been, well, first of all, there are a lot of different sites at Palmyra, a lot of yeah, different reconstructions by different means. Yeah, there, um, there have been some parallel projects that um, have been going through done by the um, ARC Foundation mm, out of Hollywood. Cool. And there's another one. Um, and they're a really interesting group. They're a bunch of VFX artists who, who turned their eye on this. And then there's another group um, out of Italy and Switzerland um, run by Dr. Um, Vassam Babe and Gabriella Fengi. And they, they actually had some really nice professional photographs that they were able to use for it. Um, neither of these have been made um, totally open along with their source material, though. Um, this version of it is um, the most complete. I, I guess the only one to have such high resolution, um, you know, and, and to, to be so so open. But yeah, there. Are, this same challenge has been tackled in parallel by by a number of different places. The the other thing I was wondering about was um, you mentioned the difficulties of getting. Um, 
uh, commercial satellite imagery, for example, to uh, help with these reconstructions. And I'm wondering if there's some way to mobilize um, organizations like UNESCO around that. I mean, we're talking, I, I'm pretty sure uh, Palmyra is a World Heritage Site. Mm -hmm. And I would think there are probably several of these that are um, uh, you know, in need of this kind of documentation and reconstruction. Yeah, I had been I'd been looking into a grant through Digital Globe, who often often does stuff like this. Mm -hmm. um, they funded a few different UCSD projects to um, I think there was a documentary about finding Genghis Khan's tomb, where they provided all this imagery and a project like that otherwise would have been cost prohibitive. Yeah, just the just the satellite photography um, that I'd been looking at to get um, adequate coverage of that region when I looked it was going to be like twelve thousand dollars or something um for for a very small piece of of this site interesting thank you for that and i want to shut up and let other folks mm -hmm. ask questions well actually we are we are past time at okay. this point so i will thank our speakers once again uh, roger and scott thank you so much for sharing this with us here at cni and to our attendees thank you for making time out of your day to join us. Uh, please join us again for more of CNI's Fall uh, 2020 meeting. And at this point, I'm going to turn off the recording and just invite any attendees who'd like to stick around and uh, join the conversation, ask our speakers a question. Please raise your hand and I'll be happy to turn on your microphone. And with that, thank you everyone and have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Diane.